Thank you, Bruce. Our next speaker is Robert Quest, and he's going to give us more of the international global perspective. He'll be talking to us about crossing international borders, and he's currently the enforcement <coughs> officer at the City of London Corporation, and also has a lot of experience in what I call the language of CITES. Robert? Um, right, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to be here, um, Senator Bill and Lila. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to give a slightly different pr perspective on things. So, this is our building at Heathrow. Um, it's bigger than that, that's the front of it. Um, we've also got DEFRA, which is our state veterinary service on site. We also have a clearing agent on site. Um, what I'm going to be covering is what our role is. Um, EU regulations, because they're obviously crucial if you're moving into the EU. I'm going to mention traces, um, I'll tell you what it is as well. Um, border inspection posts, um, who, what, where, why, how, when even. Um, problems that we come across at border inspection posts. And obviously when I'm talking about imports, I'm talking about your exports. So imports into, into the EU. And the airline world and our world is full of acronyms. So I apologise in advance. If I say BIP, it's a border inspection post. So why the City of London Corporation? Um, <coughs> City of London Corporation, part of its role is um, local government. And in the UK, local government is responsible for enforcing animal health and welfare legislation. Um, and through some quirk of history, the City of London, which is actually the square mile of the City of London, is responsible for the import of animals for the whole of the Greater London area. And as you can imagine, most animals being imported into London come through Heathrow, and that's why we have the facility there. So, we have law enforcement, animal health and welfare. Um, we also operate the border inspection post at Heathrow. Like I say, that's where the animals come through. And I'll talk a bit more about border inspection posts in a minute. Um, I've got a staff of about 30 who work 24-7 who look after the animals that pass through Heathrow. Um, I've also got another team that actually are responsible for the animal health and welfare thing within London. So they contracted to the London boroughs to look after animal licensed premises. And some of that could be laboratory work actually in some of the hospitals that have pigs and things like that. Um, and we work very closely with DEFRA and work. And as just said, uh, we do a lot of work with CITES and UK Border Force, uh, which is Customs. Uh, basically, if Customs sees anything under CITES, we get the pleasure of looking after it. So just to give you an idea of what comes through, um, one of the border inspection posts, cats and dogs have increased dramatically, really, for us. and that probably four years ago was 10,000 and that's gone up 16,400. These are actually animal figures. Um, so birds 1,200, pre-2005 that would have been quarter of a million. But in 2005 the EU banned the import of wild caught birds. So that 1,200 is pretty much pet parrots, um, birds of prey and zoo animal movements. <coughs> Reptiles, quarter of a million at the moment but it's been uh, over 600,000 in the past and a lot of those come from the states actually. Um, horses, we don't get many horses at Heathrow, it's too expensive um, but we do get 300 mostly race horses. DOC, another acronym, day old chicks, day old poults really that should be about quarter of a million. Fish, 26 million and that is fish just for the ornamental aquatic trade. So that's quite a big well organised animal movement industry actually. And rodents and lagomorphs, which is where we hit most of your laboratory animals, um, about 4,500. I'd say that's probably come down. And because of the way we collect figures, that's not just laboratory animals. That will be the odd pet rabbit, pet guinea pigs, things like that as well. And also, we get zoo movements of rodents and lagomorphs too. Um, if I'd made that consignment rather than animals, you would see that cats and dogs make up the big bulk of our work. Overall, we probably get 20,000 consignments a year. And cats and dogs, 16,400, that's probably 15,500 consignments because most of them are individuals. So you can see, and fish, that's fish make up a lot of consignments as well. So the laboratory stuff that we get is a, is a very small percentage of what we get through. 
It's also, for us, it's very easy. <coughs> it's sealed in its box. We can't take it out, put it in a kennel, feed it, water it, all the other stuff we would do with cats and dogs. So, um, Other animals we get, they're not on that list. Butterfly pupa, would, be, would you believe, well over a million. Um, beneficial insects, tens of millions, but we don't count every individual one, I would point out. Fish eggs, again, we get millions of fish eggs in, trout hatching eggs, um, so things like that. Uh, laboratory animals. So, as you've mentioned before, it's quite an emotive issue. Um, <coughs> we've had demonstrations outside our place because we accept them. I think Greg said that KLM, the bit there, they don't accept them, but we do. Basically, uh, we see our role. Anything that lands at the airport needs looking after, we look after it. So um, we don't have that restriction. But like I say, the animal rights groups have camped outside occasionally. And at Heathrow, certainly, a lot of commercial airlines will not carry laboratory animals. Um, and you can get private charters into the UK as well, which obviously will. Right, going on to legislation. Um, legislation is not very interesting, um, but I think it's important to know how it works because wherever you fly to, you've got to comply with those, those rules and regulations. So in the EU, we have EU legislation overarching it. For what we call harmonised goods, uh, we would follow that EU legislation, but we also have unharmonised um, goods, I'm calling them goods, but things like your rodents and lagomorphs are, are unharmonised. Harmonised animals are pretty much farm stock. So goats, pigs, sheep, cattle, equines, they're harmonised. Dogs and cats are as well, actually. Um, and our legislation really on this, when Europe sort of finally got its act together in the early 90s, so our legislation controlling this is sort of getting on for 25 years old nearly. So we have a veterinary checks directive, um, we have an animal health requirements uh, for imports and trade. <coughs> the way that the EU defines trade is movement within the EU, and imports are obviously coming from outside the EU. Um, so those directives are our EU legislation at the top. And to implement them at national legislation level, we have in the UK trade in animals and related products regulations. Another example, Regulation 1 2005, this is the transport, welfare and transport regulation. Implemented in England, you'll note, not the UK, England only, the Welfare of Animals Transport England order. Um, so there's one in Wales, there's one in Scotland. So even within the UK, we have different implementing bits of legislation, which I have to say generally are very similar, but they're not exactly the same. So you don't only have a mess within the 28 <coughs> member states. I mean, the, the standing joke with the EU is there's, there's one way of doing it. Uh, sorry, there's, there's one rule and 28 ways of doing it, because you've got 28 member states. But even within the UK, you've got three ways of doing it. So it's not that easy to find your way through. Um, and it's important to understand the difference between an di EU directive and an EU regulation. An EU directive um, basically has to be implemented by national rules. An EU regulation um, has to be implemented as the regulation. But there are no offences in that regulation. So each member state has to introduce its own legislation to implement <coughs> offences and how it's enforced. So that's basically how our legislation works now. Um, so, border inspection posts. So they came out of this veterinary checks directive in the early 90s. Um, there's some word there which is just blown up from the Eurolex website. But the whole concept of a border inspection post is you've got this whole EU mass now, and historically lots of points of entry. But the concept of a border inspection post is you have free movement once you've gone through it. So to limit the number of points of entry into the EU, they came up with this concept. So by limiting the points of entry into the EU, they, the, the idea was that uh, you could do proper checks. Because once something's in, it's in. So if you fly something into France, it can go straight to Denmark. There's no other checks. It just moves. Um, and that was a strange concept, really, when you've got all these different countries, that all of a sudden things could just move backwards and forwards, especially with animal health. Um, border inspection posts cover products as well, so it's, it's animals and animal products. And, and, you know, animals carry diseases. Oh, sorry, we can't hear anything. Oh.
Right, let's stand in the middle of you all. Um, oh, oh I'm, I'm walking. Right, trip hazard now. Right, okay, I'll stand it. <laughs> Wasn't me. Um, so yeah, animals come through the board inspection post or they go through the product board inspection post and they get checked. Um, once they've done that, like I say, free movement of goods, and, that, and that's the whole concept of a border inspection post. Um, BIT facilities, they can be operated by different organisations. In some member states, they're run by the government, and they can be run by the airlines. So you've got KLM, Animal Hotel in Schiphol. Um, they can be run by freight companies, uh, transit shed operators. I'm not sure about the terminologies, terminologies being the same. Do you have transit shed operators or do you call them something else? It's the cargo sheds at an airport. So, um, and the staff actually manning the border inspection post can be different. I mean, so at Heathrow, we're the local government, we run it, we staff it. But at Gatwick, down the road, um, the people looking after the animals are contract staff, contracted to a transit shed operator who operates the border inspection post. Um, however, the vets and the assistants, the veterinary assistants, are mostly government or local government. So Directive 91496, our Vet Checks Directive, it says there should be three checks at a border inspection post. So if you ship your animals through a border inspection post, they will undergo a documentary check. They will have an identification check, and that doesn't mean what you think it means. If you say on the airway bill you've got 20 pieces, someone will go along and count 20 pieces. That's an identity check. The physical check is where they look at the actual animal. So if you shipped in, um, I don't know, I'll use fish as an example, 200 boxes of fish. They wouldn't open 200 boxes of fish to check the fish. They'd probably do 10% and look at those fish, make sure they're okay, ship properly. With your laboratory animal stuff in your nice little boxes with filters, that's why the viewing panels are very important. Because obviously we're not going to open the lid and have a look. But we do like to see in there to make sure they're okay. So viewing panels are great. And the introduction of those into the LA was, was really good for us. Because otherwise it's holding things up to light to look through the filter, and that's not very, always very good. Um, traces, I'll come to in a minute, but traces issues what is a, a, called a CVED, Common Veterinary Entry Document. Once you've got that, you're free to go around Europe. Um, so traces, right, another acronym, stands for Trade Control and Expert System. Not very good acronym, actually. It's basically a database. Um, so it's used to notify movements. Part of the rules of border inspection process is you should be 24 hours notification before something comes in to the competent authority. So they know that consignment is coming in. And traces can be used to do that pre-notification. So if you're shipping into the EU and you're using an agent or doing it yourself even, you can register with traces and complete your sort of application form on that and that application form will then be generated as the as the CVED. So it, it's quite a good system and the agents that deal with, with animal movements all use it, certainly in the EU. Right, facilities at a board inspection post. So as Greg said, KLM got a nice facility at Schiphol, Frankfurt's is very new, a uh, lovely facility um, and we were opened in the 1970s, 1976. So we're probably the oldest because we were there before that whole concept of bits was thought about. 
So our facilities, we've got various rooms and things like that. Right, can you hear? Yep, I'm not allowed to touch it apparently. <laughs> it will break. So, if you ship something to Heathrow, Frankfurt, Amsterdam, well, although they don't take laboratory animals, we've just said, um, you can be pretty sure, because they've got the space and they've got the facilities, that your one consignment would go in one room, wouldn't be mixed with anything else. That's not the case at a lot of border inspection posts. They have a storage area. It's not quite as bad as Carl showed in the cargo thing. It will be, you know, heated or cooled or whatever, so constant temperature, etc. But everything will be mixed together. The last time I was in Milan, two dogs, cat, reptile consignment, uh, shipment of mice, all in the one small room. So they will be mixed. Um, and Milan is... You know, relatively uh, a busy bip as well. Another important point. Carl said it, I think, or somebody said it. There will be some common themes through these presentations. Um, check the times when bips are open. Um, and public holidays. I'm sure it's Carl mentioned public holidays. There's a lot of public holidays in EU member states, and they're not the same across Europe at all. Southern Europe tends to have more public holidays than Northern Europe, but there we go. <laughs> Don't only check the border inspection post opening times. We're open 24-7, but the state vets that work with us aren't. So, okay, your shipment can come to us in the middle of the night, 3 o'clock in the morning. That's not a problem because we've got people there. But it won't get cleared because the vets don't start work until the morning. So do check the opening times of not only the bit, some bits close, so the animals would be left in a cargo shed before the BIP opens and they could go to the BIP. But it's important, the BIP and the VET's times can be different. Right, where? So, where are European BIPs? Um, well, we've got a pointy thing here. So, for, I don't know why, but I just picked the Czech Republic there. Oh, and another thing to notice, there's non-EU countries here as well listed. This is on the Europe's website. And I don't know why, but the um, web address has disappeared off there. There should be a web address. The Eurolex website, or the European Commission website, is actually a very good website. There's a hell of a lot of information on it. So if you need to contact people, this is the way to do it. So Czech Republic. <coughs> here, State Veterinary Service of the Czech Republic. And along here, it's got something about BIP in the Czech Republic. So you can click on that, and it will bring up this page. So if you need to contact them, you've got telephone numbers, you've got emails. It tells you what goods can go there as well, which we'll come to in a minute. Well, so I think you've got products here. Um, acronyms again, HC, human consumption, NHC, non-human consumption, etc. Um, but animals. The important one for you really is O, which is other. Um, all these rules are set up for farm stock, so E is equines. And U is ungulates. So, um, but really for you, if it accepts O, others, you can use that BIP. Right, this is just um, clicking on further the French one. So it's got a list of the French BIPs. And you'll see down here, Charles de Gaulle. Um, ungulates, equines, others, 14. They're very restricted on the types of animals that they will take. So although they will take other animals, um, you do need to read the restrictions. And just to mention, um, as I said, this legislation that we're working to is getting on for 25 years old. There is a review of all the animal health legislation in the EU. Um, to It's changed over those 25 years, and it's, they're trying to simplify it. The problem we have with the EU, with 28 member states all arguing about something, they come up with a nice regulation, and then all the member states stick their derogations in it, so it makes it messy again. But we're hoping for something much more simple than we have at the moment. Right, border inspection posts, I'm just going to mention transits and transshipments. They're different. If you land at Paris and move something to Brussels and fly it out 
of Brussels, that will be a transit. It's transiting through the EU. A transshipment stays within the airport um, that it lands at. So if you landed at Heathrow, stayed there for a few hours or overnight and flew out, that would be a transshipment. Um, the problem with transits, which you can understand, but also with transshipments is, if you were flying from the States, say, to Japan, if you land in the EU, you must comply with EU regulations, um, even if you stay within the airport. And those three checks, you can have a derogation for the physical check and the identity check, but even if you stay on the same aircraft, there should be a documentary check. Well, to get the documents out of an aircraft to be checked and then taken back is a long process. I would say it takes two hours Heathrow to get documents off a plane to an office. So that's the rules. That's not always what happens because if something stays on an aeroplane, it's impractical. If that aeroplane is down for three hours, you can't do it. If it was there overnight, that's what should happen. So be aware that if you transit, transship through the EU, you should comply with EU rules. Um, other mem well, non member states, Switzerland, Norway, Liechtenstein, etc. Because they trade with the EU, they have to follow EU rules. Um, and as I said, some of those, their information is on the um, EU website anyway, so you can contact their veterinary, uh, veterinary authorities. Uh, let's go back a bit. Yeah, national rules. Obviously, they're going to have their own national rules. Planning. Um, 1 2005, which is this transport regulation, mentions journey plans and it's very specific for um, ungulates and equines that long journeys you have to have by law a journey plan for your sort of animals you wouldn't use a journey plan but obviously it makes sense to have a journey plan Carl um, mentioned the point as well so within that you need your roles and responsibilities you've got to make sure your containers are up to IATA labeling labeling is crucial and um, contingency plans so what happens if you get a delay? What happens if you get diverts? In bad weather, uh, certainly in the UK, you'll get a lot of diverts due to fog. Um, and routes can change as well. I mean, within the EU, say you were landing at Heathrow and you got diverted to Paris, if you couldn't fly back to Heathrow within a reasonable time span, you could take that consignment off at Paris because it complies with the EU. It could be cleared there and then road shipped. So that could be part of your contingency plan, is to have some sort of road thing if you've got a divert, if you've got a good transport company. Um, labels, labels, address and contact details. I mean, when we have problems, the first thing we want to do is phone someone and tell them they've got a problem. Um, we want the, prob uh, we want the uh, phone details of the shipper. The person, say it's a, it's a, I mean, a, a lab shipment, we want the person who, sh who made that shipment I think you said about having experts that just deal with exports and things like that. If their name is on that box and we can phone them, that's what we want to be able to do. We need to be able to contact the people at final destination. Invariably, if we get something from the States, we've got a time problem because it will land with us at 7 in the morning and you, everyone over here is in bed. So if we can contact someone at final destination, that's good. Your agent's details we'd also like on there as well. Um, I think, as, as Carl or Greg said, that if an airline has a problem, they'll pass it over to the agents, um, and that's what does happen. So if we can contact them. Transport company doing the road bit. If something lands at an airport, there must be road transport. Their details, are way, uh, again, is important for us. And just to say that anyone doing the road transport in the EU has to be authorised, just as do all the airlines that fly into the EU. They're, they're all authorised under this 1-2005 regulation. So the journey, I mean, probably know more about this than, than me, but obviously journeys are stressful for animals. Rabbits certainly, um, certain times of the year it's very hot, that causes them stress. Loading causes more stress, so we can get some issues. Um, one of the things with your SPF boxes is obviously ventilation. Um, those filters do limit airflow. I mean, we did some work in the UK with Pfizer actually, um, but no one really knew how much airflow you got through those filters. It was about 2005, so I don't know if any work's been done since. But um, Right, containers, plastic containers, 
cardboard containers. Carl mentioned having space bars and legs. As you can see, these haven't got those. Um, so there's not much airflow, especially the ones in the middle there. The other problem with cardboard ones, they do get left out in the rain. Um, okay, they're wax cardboard, they can sustain a bit of moisture, but we've had them where they've gone really, really mushy if they get too wet. Um, so I think we prefer the plastic ones. So viewing panel, so we can see what's in there, although you can't because of the light. But anyway, there was a rat in there. Um, not only rodents and things like that. Um, can't see what these are very well. There's a xenopus there, a frog, uh, uh, frog. So we get those moved as laboratory animals. Quite a lot, actually. And we also get newts from the States. So problems. I would say generally the commonest issues are around paperwork. And not talking laboratory stuff, but just generally our biggest issue is vets can't do paperwork. Um, any vets in the room? No. Go back to school. I mean, the EU documents make it very easy because they tell you what to put in the box, but you don't. Um, well, moving back to laboratory animals, we don't have a problem with paper laboratory shipments, to be quite honest, apart from the airlines losing it. And I would say, and different airlines operate in different ways. Some put the originals on the boxes, some want it in a document pouch, and it's separate from the goods. There's pros and cons to both approaches. But what I would say, it would be nice if there were at least copy docs on, the, on every consignment. Because even if the original paperwork's lost, we can do things with copy docs. Especially if you put certified copy and stamp it, that's even better. Um, obviously, things do go missing from the top of boxes. So if you've got a spare compartment within your consignment with no mice or rats or whatever, stick it in the box and just write on the top, documents in box one, put box one or something, or copy docs in box one. Don't put it in with them because you just end up with bedding. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, that's one of our commonest things. And you don't want your animals stopped at border, really. Um, like I said, not all border inspection posts are cut out to keep things long term. And none of us want things long term. Um, Greg was saying earlier to me that our facility is quite small for the throughput we get, but it is. But we don't, think, don't generally want anything there more than four or five hours. OK, we get things overnight, but we want it in, we want it out. Poor boxes, this is a problem. And if you get poor boxes, it won't stop the consignment, so to speak, but it will delay it. I'll come on to that in a minute, because we will repack if we have to. The other thing is, if you've got a good relationship with an airline, you don't want to get the airline into trouble. And it is the airline that gets into trouble when they land somewhere with something that's not compliant. They land it. It's their problem. Um, so we take about 25 prosecutions a year against airlines at Heathrow, and they're mostly for poor boxes. I have to say, it's poor boxes and uh, dogs and cats and, and pets, not using agents but shipping their own animals are, are the biggest problems. Think about time differences I've mentioned. Um, right, other. So, as Bill said, things don't always go right. It's a better picture, you can see that better. I mean, they're also talking about assumptions. No bedding in this one, you'll notice. Um, Bruce mentioned, Bruce number one mentioned bedding. Um, none in here, and we think this consignment got too cold. As we've heard before, if the heating's not on in a plane, it'll go down to about, I work in centigrade, so about four degrees C, um, which for a long flight is too much for, for mice. Um, another problem we had, obese rats. Stocking densities, so you can get 10 rats in a box. 10 fat rats don't fit in a box. Um, and obviously it produces more heat, and if you've overstocked them in the box, that heat can't go anywhere. So we had a, a real disaster, actually, a few years ago with a consignment of obese rats. And so they replaced them, and it's actually the same problem. So that wasn't very good. And this is a more recent case. I think on the other photographs people have shown of um, shipments of laboratory animals, they've only been stacked three high. As you can see, this is stacked five high. 
and we got called out to it, which is why it's taken on the tarmac, at the back of a cargo shed, because the bottom ones are collapsed. So it goes back to labelling. You know, if your boxes can't withstand being five high, stick on them, only stack three high. Make sure your person making the booking, the shipping agent, everyone knows that they can't be stacked. So we got called out to that because the loaders were worried that the, um, this is rabbit would have been squashed on the bottom. Actually, the rabbits in those boxes at the bottom were fine, but there were some dead rabbits, and that was caused by heat. Um, so that's just a close-up of those boxes. So the integrity of the box is broken as well, actually, with it being squashed. Tracking. Airlines track all their movements of cargo, and they track them very well um, as well. So we go back to the airline and ask them for their... You know, because we've got dead animals, we want to know what's happened. So, received at 1541 um, in June, uh, arrived on, well, departed on flight, 1917, arrived in the UK, 0714, uh, documents delivered, 912. So that's taken about two, year, two hours for those docs to get there. So all that information you, c you can access uh, through the airline. But the temperature on the day from the um, station of origin was 93 Fahrenheit. I mean, in the UK, we haven't had a brilliant summer. It's only about, go back to degrees, it'd be about 20 degrees. But, and from the post-mortem on, on those dead animals, we, and the estimated time that they died, they were probably dead before they were loaded. Just too hot. So, and it doesn't help being five high. Um, the higher the stack, the hotter they're going to get because heat rises. And you can notice that with day-old chicks, if you ever stick your hand above a consignment of day-old chicks. But they build those so they've got chimneys in the middle, so the heat rises and sucks air through. Um, so they're very good at doing that with day-old chicks. So be aware of, um, like I said, common themes, the temperature, where things are, the ambient temperatures, things like that. I'm sure these all will all come out again. Um, dogs... We would change that. That's not up to IATA. We've had um, dogs in the past, yeah, consignment of 24. We've made the airline, because the airline's landed them, buy 24 new sky kennels. That ain't cheap. Um, so yeah. the law is very clear for dogs and cats. Well, that's not me either. And my favourite photograph. Nice plastic taconic box, but the hamsters didn't like to be in there. And as Carl, Greg and Bruce will say, they don't like loose animals on their aeroplanes, especially things like hamsters that like chewing things, and they like chewing plastic taconic boxes as well. So they do get out. So be aware. So thank you very much. Take questions later.